Uh, I'm going to invite uh, our next uh, panelist to speak. Um, and um, uh, so at JustDad7 uh, uh, is handled from Twitter. Uh, I'm going to um, say a couple of words here. Um, where, where did I, where did I put your bio? <laughs> Do you want to give a little introduction and, and tell us a bit about yourself? I'm a retired lawyer. I've practiced in Manitoba doing a, a general practice for about 30 years. You know, I've been involved at various times in human rights issues and in medical ethics issues. And I became interested in the trans debate about three years ago when I just saw some strange things happening and began to dig deeper into it and realize that, you know, there are things going on that were very wrong and I needed felt I had to do something about it. So I've been active on Twitter for a while. You, you can read my Twitter threads. I also have a Substack, which is also has some material you'll, you will find interesting. And most recently, I've been in part of a group called Concerned Canadians, which Shannon is a member of, and ended up producing this document on gender questioning students. So maybe I will start my i'll share my screen and get into the actual document now what what we have here is a a document that was intended as a policy guidance for canadian schools the the paper began as a response to the decision in new brunswick to start requiring parental notice for name and pronoun changes and a group of us in this concerned canadians discussion group prepared a, a brief in support of the government's position. And after that, we decided that it would be worthwhile to expand it into a comprehensive school policy for Canada based on some of the documents that have been produced by GenSpect and Transgender Trend in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Now, the current the document has now been endorsed by about you know, seven different groups. I've got here a list of the, you know, the different groups that have endorsed it, and there are a number of links where you can obtain copies of it. The Canadian Gender Report will also give you a French translation of the document. And if you contact GenSpect, they actually had or have some printed copies. You can also, you're free to go print your own copy. I'll just show you. I went to a, a Staples and was able to get a copy printed and bound from the PDF. Now, I'm just going to get into the document. It's quite, quite long, 65 pages, lots of references. And in the time I have, I'm just going to be able to touch on some of the highlights. I guess the first thing to talk about is the title. It seems rather unwieldy, but it really sums up some of the key themes in the document. First of all, we use the term gender questioning rather than trans or LGBT to emphasize that we're talking here about children and adolescents who are still in a formative stage of their identity development. You know, many of them, some of them may become transgender adults, many of them aren't. We should not be prejudging the process by putting a label on them. Next, evidence-based means that we've tried to look at the best evidence from child development, psychology, medicine, and develop policies that are based on this evidence. Thirdly, when we say mental health focus, that means that we regard gender questioning and gender-related distress as part of a broader mental health crisis that affects young people. Now, chapter two of the policy of the document is a glossary. Now, I wouldn't skip this over. It's not simply a formality. As an earlier presenter pointed out, manipulating language is one of the key tactics that gender ideologues use to create confusion and advance their cause. To push back, you need to understand how the language is used and be clear on your own language and press the other side for clarity on theirs. For example, here we have a, a definition of sex and gender. 
you should always be very clear that sex is a biological category. People sometimes talk about sex assigned at birth or biological sex, but it should be clear sex is biological. There are two sexes. They don't change. Gender, on the other hand, is sometimes used as a synonym for sex, but is often more used to describe a sociological phenomenon, the expectations we assign to masculinity and femininity. Now here, this is something that can sometimes exist on a spectrum and be fluid. Next, the chapter three of the document gets into the faulty assumptions that underlie all of the current policies on gender identity in schools, and we identify three of them. First is the assumption that everyone has a gender identity which they realize from an early age, that there are some kids who are trans kids and they simply need to be affirmed and encouraged. This is completely unsupported by any reliable science. There's no evidence that gender identity is biologically determined, and there's a great deal of evidence that it can change over time and may be socially influenced. <laughs> you know, once again, we emphasize that children are in a developmental phase and the outcome isn't known. The next faulty assumption is that transgender rights are simply a natural extension of gay and lesbian rights. In fact, they're very different. Sexual orientation is stable, it concerns private behavior, and does not demand a medical response. On the other hand, transgender identity is usually fluid, especially in young people, imposes demands on everyone around you, and can lead to serious medical interventions. I would just make one point that one way transgender identity and sexual orientation are linked is that gender nonconformity in children is often associated with same-sex attraction in adulthood. And today, many young kids who would simply grow up to be healthy gays and lesbians are being put on a medical pathway very young and ending up as you know, wounded and angry detransitioners 10 years later. One of the points you have to make is that the supporters of gender ide ideology in schools always try to frame any opposition as simply a continuation of the, you know, the fight against gay in marriage and opposition to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender rights generally. Don't fall into this trap. Keep in mind that there are many gays and lesbians and some transgender people who do oppose medicalization of children. Some of, the, some of these people were sponsors of this document. So it's very careful in your discussions. Don't use rhetoric or take positions that are going to alienate these valuable allies. The third point that underlies the document is that Gender identity is simply a human rights issue with some mental health implications rather than a mental health issue with human rights implications. The argument here is that it's stigmatizing to suggest that trans people have a mental problem, that it's simply a, you know, an identity and it has to be respected and that any mental health issues they may experience are simply due to minority stress or transphobia. Once again, that's a mistake. Removing stigma among, around mental health challenges is not the same thing as denying that they exist. There are very strong connections between gender identity confusion and a whole range of mental health problems, and denying these connections exist and ignoring mental health means that these mental health problems are not being treated and that's ultimately infringing on the rights of gender non-conforming or gender non or gender questioning children to good mental health treatment next the fourth assumption is one that required a whole chapter and that is that 
medical transition has been shown to be safe and effective. It's simply not. I don't have time to go through it, but chapter four goes through the evidence in detail and explains that medical transition is based on a very limited number of low quality studies. The evidence of benefit is highly questionable. The evidence of harm is substantial. One point in chapter four that I do want to stress is the whole topic of informed consent. Any medical treatment requires informed consent, and this is true for gender affirming treatments in particular. Now, informed consent for gender affirming care can be a problem at any age because under the current model of gender affirming or informed consent, people are not getting a proper diagnosis. Because people, because clinicians deny the connection between you know, gender dysphoria and mental health problems, issues like depression, autism spectrum disorder are not being looked at. So patients are being asked to consent to life changing treatments without really understanding their actual medical condition. And we have to remember that these conditions, these changes are, are life changing. One in particular is sterility. I think David Todor read from the book, The, the Other Boy, where they discuss the impact of cross-sex cross hormones and puberty blockers, which will almost certainly leave you sterile if you start them at age 11 or 12. And I think you have to ask the question, can a child of 11 or 12 give informed consent to this sort of thing? And I think the answer is no. You know, we, we know that you know, the human brain is not fully mature until around age 25, and that the parts that regulate risk assessment and long-term decision-making are the last to develop. There's reasons why we have a minimum drinking age, a minimum age of consent to sexual intercourse, a minimum driving age. I remember my, you know, my son was recently, he's learning to drive, and when we were getting his learner's permit, we had to sit through a webinar where they did a presentation on the teenage brain, where they explain this very explicitly, that teenagers are not cognitively mature, they are not good at assessing risks and making good decisions. But when we talk about gender identity, all of this seems to be forgotten, and it's just assumed that you know kids know who they are and they can make these decisions. And that, as I say, impacts not only medical treatment, but it comes back to things like privacy and decisions around social transition, which I'll get into later. You know, the, ne the next chapter talks about the youth mental health crisis and how it relates to gender di dysphoria. I'm showing here a, a graph showing the increase in referrals to the Gender Identity Development Service at the United Kingdom. You can see that it started off back in 2010. There were you know, only a handful of referrals, maybe a hundred or less a year, relatively evenly split between male and female. Moving you know, 10 years later, 11 years later, there's over 5,000 referrals per year, and it looks like more than half are now females age 12 to 17. In the next slide, you can see figures from Canadian clinics. Once again, a very dramatic increase. 70% had at least one comor comorbidity, which means some other mental health condition. It was also interesting that this study found that 19% of the referrals were from First Nations youth, which is hugely disproportionate to their share in the population. I'm just going to show you another graph. This isn't part of the presentation, but it's something that you will run across very quickly if you start going onto Twitter. People, trans activists will say, oh yes, there's these increases, but it's just a matter of social acceptance. It's like how left-handedness was accepted. And they will trot out this graph. 
And what happens here is that either these people can't read a graph or they're assuming that nobody else can read graphs. Because if you look at the scale of the graphs, you'll see that they're completely different. This graph covers 120 years, and you see there's an increase of 400%, about threefold, in left-handedness over a span of about 60 years, and then it levels off. This graph covers 11 years and shows an increase of nearly 5,000% in that same time period. Now, the other thing, I don't have a graph for this, but over the last 10 years, there's also been dramatic increases in other kinds of mental health conditions affecting children, with the largest increases among teen girls. <laughs> Things like just depression, ADHD, eating disorders. And in many of these mental health conditions, social contagion is a recognized factor. A lot of the growth began after around 2012 when the front-facing selfie phone first became widely available and sites like Tumblr and TikTok oh, and Instagram allowed you know, young teens to share pictures of themselves and really ramp up the anxieties that young girls in particular feel about their bodies. Now, health authorities have warned about the harmful effects of social media use on teen mental health and other contexts, but nobody wants to explore the fact possibility that this has some link to the growth in trans-identified teens. I can't say, you know, on an evidence base that you know it's happening, but the connections look very strong and they should be investigated. Now, the other point that we discuss in the mental health ch chapter is a detransition and regret. The fact that we're working under an in, basically an informed consent model where people are, people are being started on medical transition without any sort of mental health assessment has had the expected consequence of a lot more people regretting their transition. Now, right now, there's no reliable research on the rate of detransition. But there's a few recent studies have found that you know, possible regret rates of between 10 and 30 percent over a span of about four years. Or, and the reasons we don't have the figures are because gender clinics simply aren't doing it. They're not doing any sort of systematic long-term follow-up with their patients. And patients who detransition usually want to stay as far as way as possible from the doctors who enable their transition. But one thing that's happening is detransitioners are starting to sue their healthcare providers. There's been one lawsuit started in Canada and lots of them in the US. And sooner or later, we're probably going to see schools added to some of these lawsuits. And that's going to really change the conversation. The other point I want to get into is suicidality. Sooner or later, when you start debating this issue, somebody is going to raise the issue of suicide and tell you that you're going to, you're going to be causing kids to commit suicide if you continue advancing your position. When this happens, there are a number of things that you have to point out very firmly but sensitively. The first is that there's no doubt that gender quest questioning youth are at higher risk of suicidal thoughts. However, while, while the rate of suicidal thought may be high, the rate of act serious suicide attempts and actual completed suicides is still very low. Every suicide is still you know, a serious concern, but it's not a, something that you need to panic over. Another point is that death by suicide is always the result of multiple factors. It's misleading and inflammatory to blame it to a single cause, like having somebody use the wrong pronouns or not getting access to gender-affirming care. A further point is that one of the contributing factors to suicidality is poor mental health, and the high rates of suicidal ideation among trans-identified or gender-questioning youth 
is consistent with the very high rates of general mental health problems in the same population. You know, a further point to make is that there's no evidence that gender-affirming care actually reduces suicidality. We know that suicide risk remains high before, during, and after medical transition. However, another point is that there is a lot of evidence that suicide is socially contagious. This is a reason why responsible media outlets have protocols for reporting on suicide. And they're very careful in reporting the suicide of a celebrity because that's been shown to spark copycat suicides. And constantly telling vulnerable youth, youth that they're going to be, that they're at high risk of suicide actually puts them at much greater risk. The next chapter is one that sort of started the document, which is social transition without parental consent. And this is where a lot of the themes in the previous chapters are pulled together. And here I want to start by, you know, discussing, you know, misconceptions on both sides of the debate. The first conception, misconception is framing this as an issue of parents' rights. I've looked at the law and parents in Canadian law don't have rights over their children. They have a responsibility to look after the best interests of their children. They also have the legal authority to fulfill this responsibility. The state can interfere with this, this authority to protect the best interests of a child, but it has to do so by due process of law. That means that there has to be notice of the parent, a court proceedings. It's not something that a single teacher who's gone to a three-hour webinar on gender-affirming care can do on their own discretion. The other misconception is that changing a child's name and pronouns is simply a matter of respecting privacy or human rights. Now, while it may sometimes be appropriate for a teacher to have a confidential conversation with an older child in limited circumstances, this doesn't apply to changing names and pronouns. This is a public intervention, it's a medical intervention, and it becomes an open secret. What you're doing here is not maintaining something private, you're sharing something with the whole school community, but saying, but please don't tell your parents. So I don't think, what social transition and name and pronouns are the starting point is, is a first step in the whole process of medical transition. Changing a child's name and pronouns st will start to concretize a sense of cross-gender identity, which would otherwise be transitory. You know, past studies have found that where children aren't socially transitioned, anywhere from 60% to 90% will desist from their cross-gender identification during puberty, with a substantial proportion becoming same-sex same sex attracted. However, studies have found that when children are socially transitioned, virtually none of them desist. So the Social transition should be viewed as the first step in the affirming care model, and it's a cascading series of interventions. Each intervention makes it more likely that a child is going to proceed to the next step. What this means is two things. First of all, that if it's going to be a medical intervention, there has to be informed consent. The child has to be able to understand the full consequences of the decision and consent to that. And as I've explained previously, most children don't have that capacity and need the guidance and support of their parents. The other point is that you need to have a diagnosis. You need to understand how social transition is going to affect your overall mental health condition. And teachers and school counselors do not have the 
training necessary to diagnose the complex mental health conditions that are often present in gender questioning youth. So when schools are socially transitioning, they're simply practicing psychotherapy without a license. Moving on, chapter seven discusses how schools contribute to social contagion through the materials that they're dis disseminating. And a lot of this material has already been covered in the two previous presentations. So I'm going to skip over this chapter, but if you read it through, you'll actually find a lot of backup and background material for the two previous presenters. Chapter eight discusses the whole issue of same-sex spaces and the need for private spaces and sports for women and girls. Now here, this is something else I'm not going to go over in great detail because we're getting into human rights law and there'll be another presenter on that. Now here, I just want to make the point that when people say the the law is settled here, that is simply not true. Human rights codes do recognize gender identity and gender expression as grounds of discrimination, but they also recognize a whole series of other rights, including sex, religion and belief, sexual orientation, and, you know, ment and mental and physical disability. You know, the interests of these different grounds can often conflict and they need to be balanced by a human rights tribunal which can consider all of the conflicting interests. And it should not be assumed, as trans advocates often do, that rights on gender ident based on gender identity are automatically entitled to priority. The fact is that there are very few Canadian human rights tribunal decisions where, these, where gender identity has been considered and none that I could find which actually deal with you know, students in schools. There simply is no Canadian human rights tribunal decision which has ruled that adolescent, you know, fully sexually mature adolescent boys can self-identify as girls and have a right to access to the girls' changing room. When most of what we're hearing are simply policy statements that might be endorsed by human rights, you know, staff people working for the Human Rights Commission, which are not binding policy and not legally binding, or simply political and administrative decisions which are being made by school boards and school administrators, and they should be responded to on that basis. I've just added here another slide on sports. There's some good research on sports and the need for a separate category for boy, for males and females, probably at all ages, but definitely after puberty. Now, chapter nine is the model policy itself. This was an attempt to draft something that could be used to replace some of the existing policies at a school board level. This is a starting point. It will have to be tweaked for every province, and it probably won't please anybody on any side of the debate, but it's something that was drafted to create a policy that would have a chance of being implemented and would be consistent with Canadian human rights law and privacy law as it now stands. The policy starts out by outlining some guiding principles about, you know, and we've reviewed some of those earlier in the document about childhood and adolescence being a time of growth, the need to support gender conformity, the need to respect the primary role of parents, and the fact that, yes, there are human rights protections for gender identity and gender, <coughs> gender expression that need to be taken into account. The second section deals with privacy and confidentiality. It recognizes that students do have a right to private conversations or other trusted adults about sexual orientation or gender identity. You know, sometimes, you know, children may not feel comfortable, you know, coming out to their parents or having the first conversation about a sensitive topic with their parents. And I think, you know, parents, schools simply have to respect this. 
However, when teachers have these conversations, they have to refrain from, you know, disparaging a parent's religious or cultural beliefs or doing or saying things that are going to undermine a parent's authority. Confidentiality no longer applies when students seek active support in social transition and the practice of having open secrets where the student body is told one thing but told not to tell their parents is not acceptable. Next, we get into social transition, and this is the most contentious part of it. It's, I don't think it's possible to say that you know, schools aren't going to support social transition. We need to recognize that as the law now stands, you know, students have a right to socially transition and schools have an obligation to make reasonable accommodations. What this the policy says is that social transition should normally happen only with the involvement of parents and the parents should be strongly encouraged to involve a mental health professional. I think, you know, consistent with the view that parents are the prime decision makers or have the prime responsibility for their children's health, schools can't say no, no social transition or go against a parent who is, wants to social transition unless there is some strong reason to suspect abuse or questionable motives. But parents should be involved as a default. And there is some discussion of different protocols for ways to deal with students who have a, a real and serious fear that they might be at risk of parental neglect or abandonment if they did attempt to socially transition. And in those cases, if there is a really serious risk, then that's a matter where the child protection authority should be involved. The policy also makes a distinction between name and pronouns. It recognizes that your name is something you can choose. And if you choose a, to be called by a particular name, everyone should respect that. On the other hand, third person pronouns are something that people use to describe their perception of reality. And forcing people to use preferred pronouns may force them to adopt a belief system they don't share. It can also cause problems for students who are earning, learning English as an additional language or have you know, cognitive or communication difficulties. You know, the policy rec so what the policy does is recommends a compromise where use of preferred pronouns is strongly encouraged but isn't mandatory. In other words, students shouldn't be dis disciplined for not using somebody's preferred pronouns and teachers should, once again, they should be encouraged to do it, but if they strongly object, it should not be compulsory. They might, it might be suggested, well, simply don't use pronouns at all. Simply use, use the student's name whenever possible. Two other points are it's important to have an accurate record of each student's biological sex for use in a healthcare emergency. And there has to be recognition and support for detransition on the same terms as transition. You know, the last four points are brief. Sports participation. There should always be a female-only category reserved for natal girls. That, uh, I'm using that term just to make it clear, who are not taking male hormones. For dress codes, try not to make a big fuss of it. Make them gender neutral to the extent possible. Binding and tucking. Just say no. Breast binding and tucking of genitals are two practices that are often encouraged by gender sexuality alliances, and both of these can have serious health risks, which are explained in, I think, chapter four of the policy. And schools should not be encouraging them under any circumstances. Finally, for washrooms and change rooms, there should be single sex spaces based on biological space, but provide a gender neutral third space. So that is, that's the whole of the policy. I don't know how much time I've taken, but I'm certainly, I'll go to the next slide where you can see the links where you can download the 
a copy of the policy, and I'm, of course, available if anyone has any questions. This is much appreciated, Peter. While you're still sharing the screen, would you scroll back to the trans youth can graph that shows the growth of this presentation up to 2016? I think it's one slide. There we go. So for viewers here, I just want to make uh, I build on a couple of points that Peter shared uh, uh, across the, uh, the country um, in the early part of the teens uh, of, of uh, the last decade, uh, we had gender identity included in the various provincial human rights code as protected grounds. And there's a lot of speculation about where this whole surge in uh, gender um, uh, nonconformity um, and trans identification came from. Um, and 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 how it and, and why it has exploded uh, so dramatically. Now I'm a math guy, and when I look at this graph, I see uh, about an 80 percent growth rate per year in the number of referrals to gender clinics. And if I run my calculator on that 80 percent growth model here, from about the uh, you know 1,050 presented in 2016. Um, the numbers suggest that about 10,000 people, and this is uh, pediatric uh, referrals, about 10,000 referrals would be happening across Canada in 2023. Now, we don't have up-to-date data on that, but it 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 suggests here that that this dramatic growth uh, is uh, is uh, r really significant. And I want to point to 2014. Um, 2014 in Ontario was the year that the directive came from the uh, Department of Education to uh, include policies for uh, gender uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and gender affirmation. And I can tell you that in 2024, by the uh, executives at CHEO who talk about this, there was about 8 to 12 children with gender dysphoria presenting at their clinic uh, in 2014. Same year that, that those school policies we talked about in the earlier document that we're seeing with this new trans affirmation toolkit that's, that's really doubling down on all of these things. Uh, when I ran the numbers on the presentations to CHEO based on data points shared by uh, uh, spokespeople for CHEO over the last couple of years, my estimate is that about 500 children were referred to CHEO in 2023, again, assuming the graph works the same way. And uh, we know that teachers, uh, the, the Children's Hospital of Eastburn, Ontario, and we assume other pediatric gender clinics in Canada will take mm -hmm. referrals from teachers and school administrators directly. Um, bypassing parents and compounding this issue of secrets. Um, I think the goal here, Peter, and, and really, uh, this is a, a tremendously important document for Canadians. We want to get this out to as many people as possible. The, the the differences side by side in the trans affirming toolkit that we saw first off today and this document are are night and day. They really are an inverted mirror reverse reflection. This is a credible, sensible, evidence based, uh, debated, and refined set of uh, of uh, approaches um, in, in various areas about gender. Uh, affirming care and how it's uh, and social transition in schools and we really need to uh, promote these evidence-based um, policies and practices rather than the ideological ones that we are, are seeing uh, dominate the the decision space on these issues any last thoughts uh i think that that pretty well sums it up i think we need to there's a lot more that has to be done. I think the next stage may be to develop an alternative curriculum to, to SOGI 1, 2, 3, and to start curating collections of actually useful books. I don't want to see you know, sexuality education entirely eliminated from schools. I don't, I don't think that if you look at the evidence, simply leaving it to parents often does not benefit kids. You need to have good, age-appropriate, respectful you know, materials on gender and sexuality available in schools. And you know, I think somebody has to start doing the work on, on creating that. I know I think there's a group in New Zealand that has, I've, I think it's referred to in the policy document that has started work there, but that's what I'd like to see as the, the next step in this process. Thank you 
very much once again. Uh,